Alright everybody, I'm really excited about this review and not just because I now have a background that is relevant to the topic of discussion. A lot of people like to say that they have a favorite movie. They'll say, oh, well, my favorite movie is such and such, my favorite movie is such and such. I've never been a person who really does that, only for the sake of the fact that there are so many films out there that it's difficult to really narrow it down to just one favorite. I mean, if somebody asks you what's your favorite song, well, you could say any artist, and who knows how many of their songs you're going to want to pick from and choose from. It's so much easier just to have several favorites as opposed to just one favorite. I'm about to break that rule. The film that I'm going to be reviewing is called Pan's Labyrinth, and it is by far my favorite movie ever made. Period. This movie was directed by Guillermo del Toro, somebody you may know from uh, Hellboy or Blade 2. If you saw Hellboy 1, uh, wasn't sure what was going on, if you saw Blade 2 and just didn't care for it, don't be put off by this, okay? I can certainly understand some of Guillermo del Toro's American work leaves a little to be desired, not in art by any stretch of the imagination, but in storytelling and filmmaking, there's a, there's, there's a little bit of a difference in translation. However, that is not the case in his Spanish films. Basic plot synopsis. A young girl named Ophelia and her pregnant mother are traveling to a military base where they're going to be staying with a captain. Uh, this captain is actually the father of the child. Uh, that Ophelia's mother is carrying, and being a traditionalist, he believes that his son should be born in his father's presence. Ophelia is kind of dragged into the situation, uh, more or less against her will, mostly because she loves fairy tales. And everything that she does, her life is involved around the world of imagination. Unfortunately, due to the change in location and living conditions of her and her mother, she is being more or less forced to cast aside these tendencies and these interests because the captain, of course, will be none too pleased. So they stay for a while and Ophelia runs off and does her little searching and everything else like that and comes to a maze. And inside this maze, there is a deep stairway that leads down into a cavern. In this cavern, she meets a fawn. Now, for those of you who don't know what a fawn is, a fawn uh, is essentially a goat man, which I think is probably the clearest way I could define that. It's commonly found in mythology. Many Spanish fairy tales involve fawns. Well, this fawn tells Ophelia that she is possibly the reincarnation of a princess who died centuries ago. And she now has to pass several tests to determine if she has become a mortal. And thus begins the tale. What's interesting about this film, however, is that there is a distinct parallel between her fantasy world and her reality. The most interesting of which is that the darker her world of reality becomes, the darker her world of fantasy becomes. I should probably touch on that to explain a little bit better what I mean. The captain in this movie is quite easily the most ferocious villain I have ever seen in a film. For those of you who watched Hard Candy, kudos to you. You'd probably be wondering, well, how can you say that this guy's more ferocious than either of those characters? Well, there's a little bit of a difference. Whereas Hard Candy asked you to kind of question your morality and right and wrong and things like that, this movie is very clear about it, and it's actually quite profound. Getting back to the character, however, the captain is vicious. Heartless, soulless, not mindless, extremely intelligent, uh, but very self-serving, and very much the judge, jury, and executioner on any topic whatsoever. And these traits are illustrated several times over through the event of the story, whether it be from his treatment of several farmers who were captured by his soldiers, or whether it be in just his general treatment towards Ophelia. Whatever the case may be, he is definitely in this for himself. And what's interesting is that his character doesn't sway. Whereas there's a lot of movies where you'll see kind of this general change in a character, that doesn't happen here. He is always, always focused, very determined, and doesn't take no for an answer. So you're probably wondering to yourself, well this guy is so bad, how is it that Ophelia is able to put up with this? Well what's interesting is that she escapes from the situation into a world of fantasy. But as I mentioned earlier, as things get worse and worse in her real life, things get worse in her fantasy world. And it's kind of a deviation from what you see in a lot of films, whereas a lot of films will kind of offer this idea that, you know, an escape world, a fantasy world, you know, is kind of this place to find, you know, tranquility and everything, you know, your happy place, as they call it. I haven't repressed many childhood memories I know about happy places. But in this movie, it throws that idea aside, whereas it seems that this could be an opening and welcoming invitation to a very profound state of being. It does be a very difficult path 
and a very dark path. And it's very uncertain which path she may want to take in all this. So, as an audience member, you're kind of stuck in the situation where you think that you're going to be escaping from this type of dark situation into something a little more fanciful. But unfortunately, that's not the case. You end up being dragged right into something far worse. And it's a very intriguing take on the storytelling aspect of a fairy tale. Again, whereas most fairy tales are kind of kid-friendly and everything else like that, this is, as certain reviews have called it, a very adult fairy tale. And it is an adult film. I'd like to point this out. It's rated R for a reason. This movie is violent. <laughs> uh, very violent, as a matter of fact. In fact, certain things that I just nearly passed out on uh, just as a result of their ferocity. It's definitely not for those who are easily turned off by that sort of thing or get disgusted very easily by violence and whatnot because there is their fair share of it. What is good about it, though, is that it's not violence without reason. Everything that happens, all the ferocity, all the viciousness of all the violence in this movie happens with a purpose. It happens for the purpose of illustrating a point, whether it be in regards to failure, or whether it be in regards to evil, or whether it be just for the sake of helping define the characters better. There is always a purpose for the violence that you see in this film, and it definitely helps itself move along. So anyway, you're probably wondering, well, why is this your favorite movie, Tony? This doesn't seem to be all that great, but again, you're wrong! Here's why. Never have I been so captivated by a film. This movie sucks you in, and you become just one with it. You are so amazed by everything that's going on that you want to know what's going to happen next. This isn't like Hard Candy, where you're kind of totally disgusted by what you're seeing, but it's like a car accident, you can't help but look at it, and you have to see what happens next. This one, you want to see what's happening next, and it is easily one of the best pieces of storytelling that I've, that I've ever witnessed. There's no time spent on anything unnecessary. Every single line, every single action moves the story forward, and it's very difficult to do, just by its nature. You always want to add more, or well, maybe they don't understand this, or anything else like that. Not the case here. Guillermo del Toro is very clear and concise on exactly how he wants his films done, and in this case, he succeeds admirably. But that's not the only reason this is my favorite movie.